Why, hello everybody and welcome to another video brought to you by somebody who controls this channel. That's probably me, that's right, Jack, VintageElectronicsGeek.com. Today on the workbench we're going to look at a new piece of gear that I bought. This is in some of the uh, stuff that I bought at the beginning of August. I'm filtering through. I have a couple more pieces to show you, three I believe, and then I'll probably be done at that point and maybe move on to something totally different other than showing you all this junk. But I know you like this junk. I like this junk. Yeah, I know there's a couple of you in my viewing audience that we co-sub to, like Old School and All the Gear and No Idea. So what you're looking at here is a uh, frequency synthesizer. You could tell that very easily because that's what it tells you right there, frequency synthesizer. This item comes all the way from 1985. The only literature I'm able to find on it comes from February of 1985 from 73 Magazine, a ham radio periodical, which is now defunct. And you're currently seeing that up on your screen and this is model SI-160 and at the time this advertisement uh, came out or was written this was new for 1985. So apparently the company, the way how the verbiage is uh, stated, has been around a while. Unfortunately I cannot find any information on the company and I cannot find a owner's or a user manual on this device. If you have either please let me know. A user um, a, um, what am I trying to say, Jack? That's right, I'm trying to say a service manual. There we go. That's what I need. That's what I want. Working it is pretty easy, pretty straightforward, unlike talking today. is some odd reason odd or difficult. As you see in the write-up, this is a laboratory instrument, and it said it was designed for uh, providing ECL signals into a 50 ohm load over the range of 20 to 160 megahertz with a resolution of one kilohertz. And the stepping is done through these little rotating thumb switch things. Whatever those things are uh, formally called, I think they're thumb control switches. And as you heard me just a moment ago state that it covers from 20 to 160 megahertz. My testing shown that I could actually get this to um, show on the frequency counter of about 17.5 megahertz. So that is very cool. At the time of buying this, there was also another one by a separate seller. I had totally forgot about it and I missed out on it. That one covered 0.1 through 32 megahertz. Would have been awesome to have. I'm now watching. Hopefully another one will come up. We're going to take a peek under the hood and we're going to look at this on the O-scope and the frequency counter. I'm not going to demo this through a radio because all you get with the, a radio is a DC. And for those that are not into radios, a DC simply stands for dead carrier. Kind of like what my voice is trying to do actually. For some reason I'm struggling to, uh, to speak. The voice sounds like it's going out on me. And basically what a dead carrier is is a carrier without any audio, no noise whatsoever. It's just there, silence, and that's it. And that's all this thing produces on the radio. If any of you know what a ECL signal is, by all means, let me know. I have not did a Google on it, so it could be something very simple, very easy. Have not been able to find any other write-ups, advertisements, nothing on this device. I do see, going through Google Pictures, I do see other units like this. And as, as you notice in the advertisement that I showed you on screen, it does not show a air-ready light. So maybe mine is a later version. I'm not sure. Again, anybody knows anything about this company, a service manual, by all means, let me know. Now we're going to take a peek at the cabinetry and then we'll take a, a quick peek at the, the faceplate which is pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory. I should have did that while I zoomed in but hey, what can I say. On the faceplate uh, we have controls. I'll zoom in for that. Just give you a quick 360 of the cabinet. Uh, this is just a sticker of um, service, whoever service the device, that's their sticker, that's it. 
nothing underneath, vent holes, vent hole on the top. We'll do a close up of the sticker. We have a port for auxiliary of something, I'm not sure. I'm thinking maybe a, 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 an external port for a BNC so you could put, leave this dedicated in line. Really not sure, cheap guess, or maybe plug it into a scope. AC mains, we have the option provision of going to uh, US and Europe standard output and then a, a uh, glass fuse. Here's a close-up look of the front panel. Here we have a error indicator, and all that does is let you know when you've got this outside of its 20 to 160 scope. Uh, this is uh, a PLL unit. Uh, the advertisement on it says that it's a singular. However, I, I don't think that's true. I think it's a dual, but I could be completely wrong, at least my version. We have a power indicator and we have a power switch. Again, we've got the thumb control switches. We have a amplitude or a RF output potentiometer. And then we have a BNC output. Here is a close-up of the sticker on the rear panel. And then a exciting view of the other bits and pieces on the other side. Exciting, I know. I've taken liberty of taking the cover off off camera just to save some time. I'm sure we all could use our imagination of removing four screws and lifting the case up. On the inside we have just these two power supply electrolytic capacitors, that's it. Um, the way how this board is put in and what all I'd have to do to take it off. At this point in time I'm going to leave those two caps in. I have tested this item for about three days straight. One day on the high, one day on the medium, and one day on the low frequency. Monitored it on the frequency counter as well as the O-scope. There was no issues noted on the scope. The pattern stayed the same, no fluctuations. On the frequency counter, all I saw was a, a plus of about two to three megahertz. I'm sorry, two to three hertz but it would never dip below its baseline. It would always go up about two or three and then drop back down to its baseline. This is our, our oscillator and this is at one megahertz. A whole plethora of IC chips and a, I believe, what is this, a SMC, SMA adapter. Our power supply. This is our thumb wheel block and then our two idiot lights and then our switch. Right here is our our amplitude control and then our BNC connector. On the board behind the faceplate we have a couple more IC chips. These are more than likely going to be the PLL circuitry. I'm, I'm really not sure. I have not looked at all these chips so I'm really not sure. I have this one right here that we have a adjuster to, a trimmer, and so the PLL could actually be this one as well. This one I did look up and that showed that it's good for about 80, 80 megahertz. I want to apologize to you for the fact that my voice is uh, departing me as I go through this video. So probably not a lot of talking is going to happen. Well, minimal amount has that. We do have some silk screening on the board. We have right here where it says sign, TCO, and N, I N. So hopefully my lighting is not blinding that. And you can see that. And on this side of the board, this verbiage gives the uh, manufacturer the model number and made in USA. So it looks like it says RB, revision B, B is in Bravo. So this could be a later and or the last rendition of this device. And where we have the transformer and the power supply board, we have written in ink 51-160. 
I'm really not sure what that is referencing. I have the device plugged into my frequency counter and oscope going through a T connector using 50 ohm coax BNC connectors on either end. I'm at uh, the bottom of the band, 20 megs, which you could see right here. And here you could see what the pattern that this device puts out. And here's a close up view of that pattern. And here's a, another look at it zoomed in. Zoomed in on the scope, that is. Now, as you see, as I change the amplitude on the device, that also changes. And here you can see that I am at 70 megahertz. This is what the pattern looks like for 70 megahertz. And if I was to go out, we could actually we'll see the RF carrier, which is right there. And here's the pattern at 70 megahertz zoomed in via camera. And here we are at 160 megs. Now this does not by number actually go to 106.000. This is as high as it goes. And so what happens if you did go to 160? You get that cool little error light. My scope is only a 100 megahertz bandwidth scope and this is the wave pattern that I could produce. And here it is with the camera zoomed in and you could just barely see the, the frequency wavelength in there, these little bars. And here I've got the scope zoomed in. This is about the best I could do uh, on my scope. And, but we could, still, we could see the uh, waveform pattern. Not bad for a 100 meg scope. I need to uh, tear it apart and repair channel A because I'm finding I all of a sudden need a two channel scope. The more I learn about electronics and the things I, I need to do. I have made mention that this will go outside of its projected band plan. And even though it, it, some of it may not trip the frequency counter, we can see output that it actually is producing some kind of a signal on the scope. Whether or not that's a usable signal or not, I don't know. I have not tried. Let me show you that for example. We may have to go low, but we'll see. So here's 160 megahertz, or 170. We see we lost it on my scope. But if I make adjustments to my scope, I'm unable to get the trigger to stop that. Now, let me show you by simply zooming out so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to take the amplitude over here on the bottom right of your screen and watch the waveform as I adjust it down. Now, we've got the amplitude all the way up, so we're going to turn it down. See that, how it disappears, shrinks. So that's it. There is something there. Again, is it usable? I don't know. Here we are, as you see, at 200 megs. Kind of interesting, the frequency counter is reading 80 megs. Interesting. I didn't notice that before. Our waveform, not seeing a uh, actual frequency wavelength in here. So I'm not sure what that's reading. But let's turn it down and you can see it goes away. Well, now I am getting a little pattern up here if I make adjustments here. I don't think you could see it at that length, but I was able to get a pattern, wavelength pattern here. Here you see I have it on all zeros or all zeds, depending on where about in the world you are. I've got the gain turned down and as you see, nothing. So let's turn this up. And there we go, all the way. We're getting something. 
what that is, I'm not sure. Here's the lowest that I'm able to get this to read, 17.7 megahertz. And you can see we are getting a RF signal out. And so if we adjust the amplitude, you could see fades right away. And, and I forgot to mention, uh, what is this device used for? Well, I'm not sure exactly what its intended purpose was used for, except for what I'm going to use it for and what I saw a brief mention in the description. Sintas said that you can use this as a standard. A standard is a device that you can connect to your frequency counters or just about any any device that has IC chips or, or I should say some kind of clocking mechanism, a crystal controlled or a synthesized controlled device in there. As stated, it has a frequency counter, uh, radios that work along, you know, 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz, 100 megahertz, whatever. That keeps the, uh, the speed or keeps everything in motion. And so with a device like this, I could set it on a desired frequency. Uh, most applications use a 10 megahertz reference crystal or reference frequency. And so you would take this and set it on that frequency, not this specific one, but if it had 10 megahertz, and then you would go in and calibrate your device to that frequency or within its tolerance. And now you've just calibrated that device as far as that one step is concerned. That's partly what I'll use this for if I find a frequency within that range that it needs to be clocked in. Primarily mine is going to be radio work, broadband, CB, ham if I work on ham. Anything that works within this spectrum, it will allow me to throw a DC, a dead carrier, just to confirm, yes, I'm on, on, uh, on par, on frequency. And then with my other meters, I'll be able to watch, you know, use it as a signal strength meter and see for sure that I am there by adjusting its gain. I can then help tune up the radio or said device. And there we go. So that's what this device is used for. That's what this device in my environment is going to be used for. I'm sure it could be used for a multitude of other things. Anyway, that will conclude this. What would it should have been a short video. Catch you guys later. Catch you in the next one. And... Have fun until then. One other thing, I hope the weather wherever you're at is doing fantastic. I know some parts of the world is not doing fantastic. But here you can see where I'm at. We are sizzling like bacon. Mmm, bacon. See ya. And that's it.